call the meeting to order. Um, starting with the determination of the quorum, Mr. Cook. Uh, we have seven present and zero absent, so we do have a quorum. I rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Um, I have uh, a suggestion uh, for the board's consideration that uh, um, that we modify, amend the agenda slightly so that item 8, uh, 10, which is the levy discussion, be moved earlier in the agenda um, so that it takes place be between uh, community comment and the consent agenda. Um, I'm motivated to do this because of an anticipation of community comments on, uh, on the levy and wanting to make sure that our discussion happens not uh, um, not too late after that. Um, so that would be my suggestion. Um, if there are any other suggestions or not, I'll entertain them. Oh, I'd like to add, um, in the levy discussion, um, A, B, and C, but A should be, should we have the levy before we talk about amount or term or inflation factor? So you're sort of suggesting that we swap B and A? No. Add a fourth, right? Add, add a fourth, make a new A, then the old A is now a B, and the B is added. So what is, the, what is your new A? It's an approval of the operating levy? No, it's just if we should have one. Yeah, so it would be. That would be B, be this, No. To me that seems the same as No. <coughs> What's the difference in that? To me, that's just that an approval. If it's, if it's voted down, then you don't have to talk about any other items. You get my drift? Yeah, I think I understand, but I'm not sure how that's different than item B. Item B is whether or not we approve of the levy. Okay. No, it's, that's a term. Right, but that would the be term if, is if we don't <coughs> if we don't approve a levy, the term would be zero. Yeah, exactly. So So that's what he's saying. Yeah. Well the amount would be zero too. Right. Yeah, but yeah. that's why Richard's saying saying make B A. I think that's, I think that's right. Yeah. No, he's saying add a new A. Just to add a new A, I'm just saying, do you, do we want this board to, to put the levy on the ballot? So we should vote to consider whether or not we're going to consider the levy? I'm confused yes. about how that's different. That's than basically it. That if it passes, then, then we uh, okay. talk about the amount, then the term, and the inflation factor. Well, is B supposed to be the term? Is that the question? No. B is not the Five term. Five years, ten years, whatever. The Five, term. ten, fifteen, yep. twenty, twenty-five. Yep. But that's not what B well, is. Ten more than ten. B is just the dollar bill. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. No, the term. the term. No, the term is whether it's five years, ten, ten years. I see that now. Years, now I understand. Thank you. I, I understand yeah. the distinguishing. Yep. Sorry, would B would be the dollar amount if we change. Oh right. That's what. I mean. Oh. So an additional item after. After ten, or whether to consider eleven. Okay. Um, any other considerations for the agenda? <coughs> I'll move approve the agenda as revised. Right. We have a motion. We have a second. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda as revised. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. All right, we have some recognitions of awards and, and presentations. Todd, uh, if you'd like to take that over. Yeah, uh, we do have a, a special award to give out today for Rich Hudson, and it is in recognition. You got an attachment for that from MSBOA, the Minnesota School Bus Officers Association Transportation Specialist Award, and like to congratulate Rich Hudson for this award, and it's just nice to have it. I think that in <coughs> One, give me, Garrett, how many years have we won this? 20. 20 out of the 20 years it's been running. So it's a great tribute to our transportation department for um, our school district, and a, a thanks to Garrett and, and Pat Reagan and, and also Rich Hudson for all of his work. Thank you. Are they in the audience? They are. Can they step up to the podium? To the microphone? <laughs> Thank 
<laughs> speak. Just pretend you're on the bus with all the kids. Yeah. <laughs> That's the easy part. Well, I certainly do appreciate this award. It seems kind of, I don't know, I'm just doing my job and everybody's making me feel like I'm on top of the world. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for what you do for me and our kids and our transporting them safely. Yeah, on behalf of the whole board, thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thanks. Garrett or Pat, did you guys have anything to say? Yeah, I'd like to um, thank Rich. I think he epitomizes what um, we hope to stand for at Fairboat Transportation. He's there every day, and, and um, we put him on the difficult routes and the, dealing with the difficult uh, students, and we never have to worry about him. So we, we want to clone about 50 of Rich's here, but uh, we, we have a lot of great drivers, and, and I'm glad that Rich is recognized because he deserves this work. So thank you for this tonight. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. We have a presentation. Uh, kids were all I do some myself. This isn't about how my daughters work today, is it? It could be if you want. <laughs> <laughs> They're always phenomenal, so that's good. I do have a quick PowerPoint presentation, um, and as it's just a little explanation of what Kids World is. I'm Lisa Wetzel. I'm the coordinator. I have an activities assistant, Jessica Smith, and about 11 other. Um, part-time uh, staff. So Jessica and I are the only full-time staff at Kids World. And Kids World is the school-age child care program for the district, which is a community education program that runs before and after school care, care on early dismissals that's open to all kids in the district, um, full day care, and we run a summer program. So um, when and where is Kids World? School hours are Monday through Friday, 6.30 to 8 a.m., 3 to 6 p.m., non-school days, 6.30 to 6, and that's usually located at Roosevelt. Early dismissals are 1 to 6 p.m., and they're open to all kids, as I said, and that's at all three elementary schools. Summer hours are, again, Monday through Friday, 6.30 to 6, and this summer we're at Jefferson, to allow Roosevelt to kind of be thoroughly cleaned and they have some maintenance that they're doing. So it's just a nicer atmosphere at Jefferson. We are only closed for 10 holidays, two days between the end of school and summer in order to get all of our stuff together and at one site. And then for five days during the workshop week when teachers are getting ready. So um, Kids World, um, if you want to go to the slide. Um, Kids World doesn't have any designated space, and so we do have to work within the school buildings with the space that they have, and um, the reason we're closed the week before school is teachers need to be in their rooms getting ready for school. So um, at Kids World, we try to teach responsibility, and we do this by giving kids responsibilities, um, sometimes when they ask, but sometimes not when they ask, because we find that oftentimes <coughs> kids who are having trouble behaving or being a part of the program really just need to find a great way to become involved. So it's a great way to teach those older kids responsibility and we do some character education with that. Um, we provide mentoring and that the staff really try to provide a positive example and we pair a lot of older kids with younger youth and that is really fun to watch. Um, to see the mentoring and how kids really want to help each other out and um, there are so many neat experiences to see every day. Um, today, for example, we have to walk to lunch every day and we walk to breakfast every day and then we have to walk back and it was a little hot and we have a child who's not quite five yet so he's going to be a very young kindergartner and he sometimes doesn't really like to walk and without even asking another child is like, come on, you can do it. And it was the cutest thing ever because this child just wanted to sit down in the heat and this other kid did what we as staff could never do. So. Just a shameless plug, those breakfast and lunch programs are free programs, so yep. if you have children that are interested, yep. please send them to the high school. Exactly, and it's a neat service that Kids World has been able to offer hot food 
Um, otherwise, the kids always had to pack their lunch. And we do still offer kids that option. We keep the site open during lunchtime so that kids can stay back if they choose not to walk. Um, and on rainy days, and if it gets really, really hot, um, Garrett will give us a bus. <laughs> so it's good. I don't know, give, that might not be the right word. <laughs> but we can get a bus. So, um, and again, kids confide in us sometimes when they won't confide in other people. So that's a neat part of what we do too. Um, interpersonal skills and intrapersonal skills. So we help kids learn how to be friends and how to be caring. And that was kind of the example I just talked about. Um, and we also do that by letting them share and be good listeners. Um, as far as interpersonal skills, again, we try to pick kids that we know have um, certain behaviors or just certain needs and we try to meet those for them um, by kind of pushing their comfort zone a little bit. We all have comfort zones on what we're comfortable with and what we're not and we try to help kids grow in that respect. We instill learning through science, tutoring, reading, and community exploration. And I think that's one of the funnest things we do is we really explore our community. You'll often see us out and about, um, not just walking to lunch and breakfast. Um, but we have done the library programs. We have walked to um, the, um, we go to, when we were up at Roosevelt, we go to Keystone. When we're at Jefferson, there's another assisted living facility close by that we walk to. Um, we really try to find things in town. Um, a trip coming up is they'll walk to um, a local grocery, or they'll get to a local grocery store and a local pizza place, and they learn how those industries operate and how they're part of the community. So trying to instill kids that this is their community and we should be proud of it. Active time, we play games, um, and we do that several different ways. We do child talk games, we do staff talk games, and we just do regular games that kids all know how to play. Um, really emphasizing more co cooperation than competition. Um, when we're kindergarten through sixth grade, um, often kids who haven't been in school have a really hard time with competition. Not that we don't wanna expose them to it, but it's not the only thing we're gonna do every day because it gets tough for them. Summer camps and field trips, and all the school board members have our summer packet, and we run two-week camp themes. So throughout the summer, there are 18 different themed camps, and the kids can choose um, their three camps um, offered every two weeks. So there's um, six different camps that every child can choose, and they can choose from one of three camps. Um, and oftentimes those camps have to deal with our field trip too. So um, for instance, we have a, um, a final frontier camp that's gonna talk about space and um, some of the planets and all of that, and we're going to Mayo Planetarium. So we try to fit some educational field trips in along with some fun ones. We visit the aquatic center regularly um, and we try to make our field trips reasonable so that um, parents can afford that and they're always optional as well. And the summer food program as we've talked about. Our average numbers for this past year are that we have 45 kids per day um, between the three schools in the morning and we average about 105 kids in the afternoon. And so that's 150 kids every day um, during the school year. There are 242 kids that are registered, were registered for last school year. And the reason there's only 150 kids who come every day is that we still allow flexible scheduling. So unlike a lot of daycares where there's only a weekly rate, we don't require that they buy into the weekly rate. And in this community, again, it's important to know your community. That's really important because there's a lot of people who work different shifts. And with the economy too, it's important to allow that flexibility to try and keep it as reasonable as possible for people. Um, yep, thanks, Drew. <laughs> Summer 2011, we had 79 students per day. Um, we have gone down so far um, this summer, but that's only, I was only counting like the first, I think, six days of summer. So our numbers typically go up because that first week a lot of people take vacation um, and kids are in summer school. So, um, 
I think we'll be right in the ballpark, which again, considering the economy, we're hanging in there. So, um, And there are 125 students registered this year for summer as well. Our goals for 2012 and 13 are to continue to provide affordable quality programming in a safe, enriching environment, to maintain a balanced budget, which is becoming a struggle, um, trying to find that um, balance between affordability and being able to um, not lose money on the program. And then to look at investing in an attendance and billing computer system um, parents and staff would use to check the kids in and out with, and it would automatically generate bills based on the sign in and out time, saving staff time and dollars and increase the accuracy of billing. So that's one way we're looking at it may be some initial money at the beginning, um, and this may have to wait another year depending on what finances look like. Um, but it's something to look into because it offers, it frees up a lot of staff time. I have one staff person who that's basically their entire job. And it's all manually input um, information and that gets very hard with 242 kids that you're billing for every couple weeks to make sure that we're accurate too, so. Any questions? So can you say a little bit about how you account for billing right now. So if I bring a child in one day and not the next, how do you keep track of that? They sign in and out on attendance sheets and it's, um, they, Jason can probably talk about it. <laughs> they fill out a calendar for the summer or the school year and so we know what days to expect them. Um, we do not have uh, sick days um, and so if a child is scheduled and doesn't show up, the parents still build for that. So we manually have to go through these attendance sheets to determine how much they're to be billed. And in the summer, we only have a full day, we have a weekly rate, which is $115 per week. Um, we have a daily rate of $25 per day for the first child and 23 for the second child and third and fourth for some people. And then it's $15 for a half a day of care, which is five hours or less. And then if you have more children, it's 13 for the remaining children per day. Um, during the school year, we bill hourly. So we have to cal hand calculate those hours. And we do that. The staff, the site staff do that every morning and every afternoon. So it's not like when we go through billing, we necessarily have to do all of that. It's, it's done as they kind of check and make sure that parents are checking their children in or out. Um, <coughs> how, do you, how do you handle accounts receivable in a situation like this? How do we handle it? Yeah, if, if somebody gets <coughs> in there. Jelly. Lots of letters, and then care is, um, if, if, care, if their payments get too far behind, then we regretfully discontinue care, and that's in their contract that they sign um, and so then at that point, we send them letters, and if it gets too far out, we look at collections. Not the happiest part of my job. <laughs> Lisa, Lisa, is there any substitute, um, uh, wrong word, subsidy from the district for the program? Um, we get the buildings and are Otherwise not paying. it's self-sustaining, right? Yeah. It's, it's, Parent generated. Um, there is a small amount of levy dollars that come in in order to provide care for children with special needs. Um, and again, those kids are such a joy to have, and it's the experiences that kids get from that at helping other kids out and understanding that we all have different abilities and we all have different gifts is a very neat thing for kids to experience. I think, too, it's I don't know if the building's really a subsidy or not. If it's in it, um, part of the rules for community ed and general fund is that if the buildings are, we're already providing an education for other kids. We're right. we're still providing an education for the the kids world and the after school programs um, as well. There's really not a conflict or right. subsidy involved. It's we would have paid it anyway. And we have a great relationship with the buildings. I think the staff. We try to hire staff who are often have other. Um, part-time jobs at the school buildings. So we're able to work with secretaries and principals and building staff and creating a 
a continuous environment for these kids and that it just doesn't happen from eight to three. Other questions for Lisa? I think another one of our benefits is we hit these parents every day. Mm -hmm. You know, they have to check in and out with us, and if they have a question or we have a question, we have contact with them every day, and that's a unique piece of community education that we have direct contact with the parents as well as the children. Thank you, Lisa. If there aren't any other questions, then I'm just going to share my completely biased view, uh, <laughs> uh, which is uh, um, my wife and I have been using this program now for about five or six years, I think, right? And uh, um, it's, uh, it's been a wonderful program. It's extremely flexible for parents. Uh, there's programming every day, so I know my kids aren't going home to watch TV or something like that. And it's been a fantastic program, and, and in no small part to your leadership, Lisa, so we appreciate that. Thanks. I'm kind of anti-screen time because I figure kids do that. So my staff have to come up with unique ideas. Not that we don't have computer time or um, we watched a movie today because it was really hot after the walk back from um, the high school. But yeah, we really try to keep the kids busy and involved and like working with each other because that's something I think the school day ha is so focused on academics because that's their job that we tend to forget that kids have social needs too and how to work together. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks. All right, next on our agenda uh, is community comment time. Um, uh, just in case, uh, I suspect we have uh, um, some people here tonight to discuss uh, the levy. Um, just in case there's anybody here who wants to discuss something other than levy, I'm actually going to start with that. So um, if at this moment you would like to come forward and speak to the board on a topic other than levy, uh, now is the time to do so. I always wait just in case somebody's nervous. All right. Um, seeing uh, none for that, if there's anyone in the community who would like to come address the board um, to speak on the, the levy, uh, now is the time to do so. Uh, as usual, there's a three minute limit uh, per speaker. Um, normally we talk about a 15 minute limit per topic. I think for tonight I'll dispose of that given the nature of the topic. Um, but I would ask that speakers still keep in, in, in respect for other speakers as well, that uh, speakers keep to the three minute limit per speaker. I would appreciate that. So at this time, if you would like to come and comment on the levy, uh, now is the time to do so. And I'm here representing uh, a group of parents that would like to see a levy pass. And uh, we just we feel that it's imperative that a levy be communicated in a way that is very transparent and concrete. And by saying that, for an, an example, if you say the money is going to be sent, spent on A, B, and C, we feel that it should be spent on A, B, and C. Um, we, we feel that the voters have an impression, or the community has an impression, that the board will find additional funds elsewhere, as has kind of happened in the past. And in addition to that, we feel that the board also needs to educate the voters and the community, community about education and how money is spent on students and how, it will, how money benefits all students and not just certain demographic categories of certain students. I just feel that there's a lot of the community that, that community that just does not understand education and how money is spent. And um, then we also feel that we don't only want the levy to pass, but we would also like to see the community be a little more supportive, supportive of Fairville students, the education and the future of mm -hmm. our community, and in, invest in the education of our community, and then and just not only compare us to surrounding towns, because we're Fairville, we have we have a great community, and I think it's just time for people to understand that we need to invest in that community. Thank you, Nicole. Nicole. Anyone else like to come forward and speak at this time? Most of you know me by now, but I have not met Deb Davis. My name is Deborah Salonik, and I am a candidate for the school board. 
Um, I have a few things to say. I am not for the levy. Um, I do not feel like the public has been educated enough as to where the money went, the $1.2 million that was spent. If we had that $1.2 million back, wouldn't that be great? Do they know that it went to teacher raises? Do they know that it should have been used for programs to educate our students instead? Wouldn't that be great to have that money back so we can put it back into programs? Did we think about that before we spent the money? I'm just wondering, um, at the Hispanic focus group, um, I attended, a question from the crowd was asked um, as to where they see the priorities for the school district from here on out. Tom, you answered that we have to look at cutting programs. None were made by using our savings account. Can't do it for going forward in the coming years. If we could pass a levy and make it large enough to keep the programs we lost and save current programs, that would be the goal. In one statement, you said we lost no programs, and in the other one, you said we did. So there's a conflict here. I think we need to educate the public as to where the money was spent, and that would be my goal. I would like to have that $1.2 million back and use it for programs, for children, for education. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Other comments? All right, seeing none, uh, we'll close that item of the agenda and move along to um, what is in agenda item 8, 10, the levy discussion. Todd, do you want to walk us through this? Yep, I can. And the uh, Four items, just to be clear, that we're going to look at voting on are A, uh, whether or not to go forward with the levy this fall, and B, the amount of the levy, C, the term of the levy, which can be a maximum of 10 years, and then D, whether or not you want to put the inflationary factor each year for the levy. So the first part of it is whether or not you want to go for an operating levy. And just to remind folks, the um, piece where the school board went through a three-month process of reviewing $1.2 million worth of cuts in order to balance the budget. The board chose to cut $425,000, and I think that's somewhat what Tom was uh, meaning before. And then the other $800,000 that were not cut, we used to um, take from the uh, retirement fund, the OPEB piece, the post-retirement benefit fund that's a reserve account for the teachers and for the staff who have those post-retirement benefit funds and the remaining dollar amount is from the general fund. So you're going to see a decrease of the general fund on all the the entire general fund of about eight nine hundred thousand dollars to balance a budget for this fiscal year 12-13. We talked about the idea of making all the 1.2 million dollars worth of cuts to balance a budget next year and the board decided not to make all those cuts, so we used that fund balance to balance those whole things out. But as uh, we talked to that whole piece, the other, the other aspect of that is that if the board chose not to make the, the cuts to balance the budget for next year, then they needed to look at a potential operating levy in order to raise more funds to offset those cuts. So that's where we are today, is to discuss whether uh, you want to go forward to the voters for an operating referendum because we will be showing a deficit next spring of about $1.6 million if you uh, do not pass a levy. So whether they're for salaries, I mean, it's very 
Um, I mean, you can, you can throw those numbers all over the place. We spend $2 million extra on special education. We spend a, a large amount of money on EL. We spend a large money, amount of money on AP classes. We spend a large amount of money on, on uh, vocational ed. And uh, we keep on chipping away at the general education portion of the formula. And that's the, the piece where we have to start looking at, sub, um, uh, looking at new revenue sources in order to support that. The other piece you have to understand is that over the last 10 years, there hasn't been even the, the amount of revenue that, revenue that the state has provided for school districts has not even been in, an inflationary factor per year. If you took the average number of dollars that were received from the state, it hasn't even hit the, the rate of inflation. So it makes a lot of sense that the expenditures are exceeding the revenue dollars, and uh, you've hit kind of a fork in the road where you have to make a choice of whether or not you you choose to make more cuts to the programs in order to balance a budget or you raise revenue. It's as simple, it really is, is as simple as that. So the first thing you need to decide is based on the last four months of discussion that you've had with community members, with school board, with focus groups, with finance committees, and the people that you've talked to is whether or not you want to, first of all, go for an operating uh, levy next fall. Right. Thank you, Todd. Um, perhaps as a, as a, if we're going to treat these as four separate questions, maybe uh, uh, before we talk about an amount, uh, uh, let's discuss whether or not the, the board would like to move forward with a, a levy at all. I would like to make and a motion that, that uh, uh, we do not put this in front of the voters. Okay, so we have a motion. Is there a second? Here a second. Um, so, uh, uh, thoughts, comments from the board on, on whether or not to um, move forward on a levy? Uh, Jason, I would, you know, premature to, uh, to make a motion before we have some discussion. I'd like to know, uh, Todd, uh, in the focus groups that you attended, and Tom, you obviously didn't, and I know Jason, you did. What was the sense of the participants of those focus groups? regarding the possibility of the levy uh, being proposed. I think, and, and Howard is at a, at a focus group as well, I think it is overwhelming that the community wanted at least give a shot for a referendum next fall in order to avoid the cuts. So and I don't think there was a, a consensus almost. Consensus that the levy should be proposed. Not a total consensus, but pretty darn close. Thank you. I think we heard it from a pretty good cross section business people, farmers, parents. And I, th I think that, uh, the, you know, the sense was that this is in the best interest of the community as well as the children. In the focus groups that I attended, I'd say that that was the predominant feeling. There was certainly debate about an amount, but, uh, there seemed to be quite a deal, great deal of support within the groups that I saw and amongst people I've talked to otherwise uh, for at least considering this, uh, this level. All right, any other comments on this item of whether or not we should move forward with the, with the levy at this time? Well, I, I would just say if you look at page 160, which is the financial first presentation, uh, on the top of the page is projections with no increase in levy. I think that is even with the most horrendous of cuts, that's not even doable. Right. All right, any further comments? Hearing none. I'll entertain a motion at this time. So moved. So I didn't specify what the motion would be. Let's make sure we're very clear. <laughs> what I'm thinking. <laughs> would you like to bring forth a levy to the taxpayers in November? All right. We have the amount to be specified uh, with some further discussion. Okay. We have a motion to move forward and bring a, a levy uh, to the voters this, uh, this November. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. 
Or say James did the second. Or James. <coughs> or James. Or James. Or James. <laughs> you have the next one, Howard. Yeah. Um, I have a motion and a second to any further discussion on this, this item. All right, hearing no further discussion, uh, why don't we go ahead and have a roll call on this item? This is now item 10A. James Wolf? Aye. Jerry Robichaud? Aye. Richard Olson? No. Jason Engberg? Aye. Deb Davis? Aye. Tom Casper? Aye. And I'll vote aye. And it carries 6 1. Right, motion passes. Um, next on the agenda, agenda is to discuss a levy amount. Todd, do you have further information there? Yeah, we did. And based on the focus group discussion and some of the discussion that we've had, we wanted to do two things. We wanted to make sure that we preserve the $1.6 million worth of cuts that we've talked about. And actually, we've talked about $1.1 million of cuts. You've seen that, that list many times. And then the other piece was to uh, raise enough revenue so that we could generate some programs that we wanted to offer that would help enhance our, our programs at, um, in our K-12 structure. This is just general fund, so it's, it doesn't, it's not reaching any of the community at pre-K, it's just K through 12, which the general fund covers. The, um, and we work backwards. We, we use the dollars as kind of a parameter to, to go to our focus groups and gauge a, a threshold of, of how much uh, tax increase they could tolerate, if they could tolerate any at all. And so that was just a framework to, to begin with. After we got an idea from the last board meeting, then we met with the administrative staff and, and the finance director to try to figure out, okay, how much is this really going to cost? So starting with that blank slate that we had last time where we put all those programs together where we believe that's our bare minimum of having a, a well-rounded education for kids, we added about six FTEs into the amount we actually, I actually gave you another amount with nine FTEs, um, but think, we think that we can offer uh, more vocational ed courses, uh, maintain and add to our music programs, maintain and add to our art programs, which I believe is uh, what we really need to do. And then we can also add three different staff members, and I don't know how specific you want to get, but they could be a classroom instructor or they could be EL instructors. Either way, we'd like to keep class sizes low and also help address the one-on-one -on -one needs for our EL population, which we believe in the long run is going to save everybody money. So the first scenario, going to a $600 per student levy, would generate the six FTEs. If you wanted to generate another uh, three FTEs to allow the EL program, the three EL staff members, and in addition, three kindergarten teachers, and you'd end up, or three other staff members, then you'd end up with $680 per student. Obviously, the majority of the money will go to save those programs that you have seen on that list of the $1.1 million worth of cuts, which has been made public for the last four months. So. Um, we do not have the list of items that would be reduced by $700,000 yet. We haven't worked on that list, but we purposely haven't worked on it because we wouldn't have to cut that till next spring. Okay? So I can field some questions for you if that was a little bit too vague. Questions for Todd? Uh, do you have any projections on the ending fund balance at the higher rates that we hadn't had before? The uh, 600 for, you mean if we, for, for a levy or for? No, for different levels. Uh, yep. We had these graphs earlier. Yeah. And now you've added some higher levels. Uh, but right. what's the projected fund balances that we're looking at after five years? Yeah, and actually one of the levels is, is lower than what we talked about before. So we can get to the, we went out three years, first of all, not five. We, we just. Both Clean and I agreed. We, we don't have enough data. I don't know how we can predict anything after three years. So realistically, again, we're, we're trying to use that common sense scenario. After three years, with a $600 levy with the additional six FTEs, full-time teachers, we can get out to three years and end up with a 9.5% fund balance. It's on page 160 of the board packet. I see it. So that still puts us in the red 
after, as a fund balance, I mean uh, in a deficit for that specific year, the fund balance is still 9.83%, but we aren't adding to the fund balance in the third year. Correct. That would be our bare minimum. We tried to look at that minimum piece too, and that was a, a pretty big piece of our conversation. But that's what those programs would cost, and that would get us out to three years. So I did talk to Colleen as these numbers, and the idea was to keep the fund balance not at 9.5% every year, but that we would have that as a minimum. It would fluctuate above it. Some of and, you know, specifically, I can get specifically, as Nicole asked one of, the, one of those questions, we'd love to do a community service program, a full-time equivalent in the vocational ed course. Um, that's, and then also add some of those vocational ed electives that we've, almost every single focus group, especially the, the chamber and, and the rural focus groups, really emphasize that they wanted to add. Right now, we have a .8 art teacher, 9 through 12. We used to have three. And we would add a full, we would add .2 art to make that a full-time art person. And then the music, we'd like to have a separate music program in the high school and a separate music program in the, in the middle school. You lose money because you have to pay the teacher to transfer from one school district to the next, and that's not good use of funds. So if we could separate those two items, um, that would be the other expenditure for that. And those are the first three FTEs. So those are some specifics, Nicole, that we use. If you want my suggestion, my suggestion would be, and that mine would be to, to go at the minimal levy, would be the $600 per student levy. And can you say uh, why you chose that rather than the higher one? I think just because the unpredictability over the three years, and we, we certainly would love to add some more items that are on. Um, We'd, we'd love to have nine FTs that are on there. The hard part that we're trying to, to get to is are those specific areas of, um, of where we'd use those FTs, getting in the exact locations and then, and then following through with that promise to make sure that we're going to be putting them in those exact locations that we've talked about. Uh, I think it would be better for us to look and take a year to experiment if we're looking at a longer uh, day and or not a longer day, but uh, a seven period day or, or items like that that are more specific to the programs. If we want to look at an emergent program or if we want to look at a, a year round program, I think that we can take a look at that, but I, we just don't have enough time, I don't believe right now, to really, to the full extent that it really deserves to offer that research. Um, Todd, so what you're saying is if um, your recommendation is a $600 over and above what we currently have. And you feel that'll give us enough latitude to uh, take a look at those other program additions that you just referenced. Um, the ELL learners, the kindergarten, uh, seventh period day. Yep. Um, and year round school. And year round school. Yep. I don't think the numbers for those that are in here, but no, look at the first no, no, no. no, but that'll give us the latitude at least taking. I mean, if we don't get the $600 levy with some of those additions, and I, I don't think we have a chance of looking at those programs <coughs> in the future. Well, if we don't, we're looking at a $3 million cut. Is that what I see in, in, in 2015? Yes. We would cut $3 million. Mm -hmm. And that's projected what for staff raises? Three percent a year? Well, we do the we did the inflationary factor for everything, three percent, but that would include everything across the board. Well, and you know that 80, 75 to eighty percent of the expenditure of staff. So I would say that that would be a good estimate, Richard. Would be three percent across the board. Some might be higher, some might be lower for different areas. But we also have other expenditures we say. That's what I mean. It, I mean we're going to see some high. It, expenditure increases for the private sector too. If you could guarantee me that the private sector wouldn't increase anything outside our school walls, that'd be terrific, but that's not reality either. Yeah, but right now the private sector isn't doing too well no matter what anybody says. They're still charging schools. 
What about the economy? What uh, house is based on the economy, like uh, high unemployment or underemployment? And then we're going to ask the taxpayers to pony up more? Well, if we don't cut any teachers, that's going to help the employment. <laughs> okay. Because I've talked to many people out there, and um, I guess in my little circle, that they just don't have the money, especially of the, of the mm -hmm. senior citizens. They're on a fixed budget. And where are they going to get, you know, what are they going to cut back on? Food, medicine, heat? I've seen those cases. We talked to the senior citizens focus group. And I, who, Jason, were you at that one? Oh, I don't know if you can, maybe instead <coughs> of having me talk all the time, you well, can reflect on what happened. Yeah, I, I think that's a very fair point, Richard. I think it's an important one for us to, to think about any time you talk about taxes. Um, unfortunately, you have to ask that question at, at any tax level that, that you have. There, there isn't a magic number that's okay for taxes or, or not okay. Um, I think one of the benefits that we have is uh, the ability to ask the community uh, directly uh, whether or not they support this. Uh, we don't get to simply raise them without asking. So I think that um, uh, whether or not that's uh, the, the right question to be asked will, will be answered by the community and they'll have the opportunity to vote on that. Uh, but I think it's fair and, and, and not to uh, uh, belabor the point, Richard, but uh, um, w with all due respect, I, I think I would love to hear an alternative. Uh, I think the community is deserves an alternative. If, if uh, we're not going to propose this, they need to know what the alternative is. And I think if you're proposing that we not do this, the community deserves to hear what the alternative is that you're suggesting. Um, I think that's a fair question. Well, again, it's uh, I'm responsible to the taxpayers out there, and basically what they're saying, or I'm telling them, and they're just really repeating it, that we have to watch expenses, and that includes raises. As you know, on the board and the public, I've been against raises, and that's uh, uh, one of the first places I would look because I believe in the budget we have budgeted 3% a year that's in our budget documents that we'll be approving here later on well uh, there's a lot of people that are not getting 3% lucky if they even have a job and we're saying yeah we're gonna pay these teachers and other staff too well but what about the people well that we are can pay the taxes right. Um, you know, we, that's, we, that's, what, that's the ones I represent, mm -hmm. and that's the ones I report to. I think that's, that's fair, Richard. And not, but to, I, and I not think, to the board, I, I report right. to the taxpayer. I understand that, Richard, I, I, and yes. I think that's a fair point. I think, uh, um, you know, the only other point I would make is that even if we didn't put the 3% in there for the future, we still have a deficit to cover, and we would still need to do something to cover that. And so let's assume that we could, we could do hard raises. That would have to be negotiated. That hasn't yeah. happened in the past. Um, uh, how but would you it, but it could forward? start. It could start. I, I would say it really I could start. With all the respect, the put last more <laughs> burden upon the taxpayers. I mean, I'm sorry. I think that's fair. They are burdened enough. I believe the city and county taxes are going to be going up, and then we're going up. I believe everybody's tax bill because of uh, what the state done. Our taxes went up. Real estate. Is that correct? I, I think that's a fair point, Richard. I really do. Did your taxes go up? Yes, Richard, they did. Thank I you. think that's a fair point. Um, I think, though, you know, the idea that we can negotiate a contract without raises, uh, uh, the last time that that was tried, as you know, every single member of this school board who was up for election did not get reelected. Uh, they were all replaced on this board. So I think, uh, personally, I think that's unrealistic. If I thought it was realistic, it might be something I would think to do. Um, so that's my feeling on that. I think when this all balances out, we sort of have three choices. We can talk about salaries, and we can talk about cuts, or we can talk about raising revenue. I think we have to be realistic when it comes to salaries. Uh, I know there's many who disagree, um, but uh, uh, and they'll certainly have the option to, to uh, voice their opinion uh, at the time of the election. Um, but uh, um, we caused a lot of hard feelings the last time we tried to, to be uh, um, too strenuous on that. And uh, in addition to which, uh, the last two times we settled for less than the last time that was tried. So we've actually been more successful in keeping those costs low 
um, with uh, respectful negotiations than to, to try and go overboard. Um, if if uh, we keep salaries as low as we can, uh, the only other two options here for balancing the budget are to, to make cuts or to raise revenue. Uh, I don't want to do either. Um, so I feel very much like I'm choosing the lesser of, of two evils here. Um, but I, I'm certainly doing what I think is uh, needed for this district, Jerry. James, did you want to go right? Richard, I want to express my respect for your position. You've uh, been consistent um, ever since I've known you about uh, your commitment to the taxpayers. However, I'd like to make a clarification that every one of us on this board is accountable to taxpayers. You are not the only one uh, who is accountable. And uh, in November, they will have a chance to uh, not only voice their opinion about the levy, but also about who's running for the school board. Um, and with all due respect, uh, and I agree with what Jason, we have no options. I'm not going to sit on this board and devastate our educational program for students. I'm not going to sit on this board and undermine the commitment and the dedication that our staff has to the students that they're teaching in this district. My kids went through this system. I have a great deal of regard for the staff members in this district. Um, and what they're doing, and they're dedicated, and, and you uh, talked about the Blue Ribbon at Lincoln and how you were instrumental in, in focusing on that. That would have never happened without the dedication and hard work of the student, of the teachers at Lincoln, who give their hours and hours and hours to make sure that our kids are receiving a, a right education. We don't have any options. The only way we can maintain our program, just maintain without even adding any additional programs, is to go to the taxpayers. That's what the state of Minnesota has said to us, that if you want to have additional programs, we're not going to help you fund it. You go to your local taxpayers and have the community people tell you what kind of a program they want. And as seven members of this board, six members who voted in favor of it, I think we have an ethical obligation to say to the community that we want to have this program for your children not only the current children in this program, in the schools currently, but those that are going to be coming up uh, through the uh, system. That we want to make sure that they're afforded a high quality, comprehensive educational program. And the only way we can do that is to go to the taxpayers and ask for additional resources. I'd like to respond to that. I'm, I'm glad I deferred to you because you said it much better than I could have, so I'll just second that. <laughs> All right, so the question I, in front I'd of like us. To, I'd like to respond to that, Please to the Chair, yep. that uh, I was uh, involved in the, uh, the first levy at uh, 385 in 2005, which I actually went out and promoted it, uh, along with uh, another board member very heavily, that uh, a lot of things were, um, Got to watch my words here. That uh, the money didn't go to where it should have been. Um, the board was not fully informed. Um, we uh, reduced class sizes for a year. They went back up. Um, and I've talked to many different members, especially uh, Mr. Casper, about starting a program like his uh, media specialist, or if we start the seven period day. Uh, then all of a sudden uh, we have to change, we have to drop it. Or music, we add music and then we have to drop it because the money maybe gets absorbed into staff raises beyond our budgeted amount, which is, happens to be 3% a year. And I've stated publicly that I don't think that the uh, uh, staff will agree to you know 6%, there. that's their starting point and go above it. That's my opinion for what it's worth. Um, then I have a deep concern about uh, um, conflicts of interest also uh, on the board of does anybody benefit from a, a staff increase or even retirement? I, I have a problem with that. I, I, that's seeming dangerously close to an accusation, Richard, and I would like to hear a specific on it. Um, what specifically are you? Is your wife a teacher? Yes, and she will not be rehired with a, with 
an increase. She has tenure. So um, will this will this benefit? Does any kind of levy? Not just in the slightest, and I I think that's frankly beyond the pale for you even to make that accusation. Well, Richard, I'll just it was it was well, Richard, you've just become very personal here, okay. um, Richard, and and and. Uh,